Well, an audience is an audience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and unfortunately, I just have a bad, um, I, I have a stiff neck right now. So oh. sorry about that. Yeah. Sorry to hear. Yeah. Mm. And it's just a lot of typing and sitting at the computer today. Mm. Okay. Have I met you before, Arjun? Yeah, uh, hello. So oh. we are going, uh, so this is another session of our Space Career Talks. And on behalf of STEM and Space, this is Dr. Mila Mitra, welcoming all of you for the talk today. So yeah. uh, with me is uh, Dr. Padma Yanamandra Fisher. And I'm so happy to welcome her here today. In addition to being a well-known uh, space scientist, again, I'm lucky to have known her from, uh, from when we were young. So I've seen her in her path as she, as she became such a well-known scientist. So also with me is Arjun Gulia. Uh, uh, he's going to be hosting the questions. So students, I hope you've all been enjoying uh, the talk today. I, I hope you've all been enjoying the career talks that we've been doing. So uh, I'm very happy today to welcome Dr. Padma. Thanks, Mila. So let me introduce Dr. Padma uh, Yanamandra Fisher. She is Senior Research Scientist at Space Science Institute, Boulder, Colorado. She is a physicist and also an observational planetary scientist. Her interests range from the physics of light matter interaction in the solar system, polarization of light, to, to infer surface properties on atmosphere-less bodies or planetary atmospheres, uh, scattering properties of planetary rings and comets, and uh, characterization of exoplanets. Uh, so, you know, you've all been hearing about exoplanets from us. So it's very interesting that she's been uh, working on exoplanets. She is also very active in the fields of outreach and citizen science. She is a reviewer for educational products for NASA and has incorporated citizen science approaches into the study of total solar eclipses. And she has done this in a collaborative way for the total solar eclipses in 2017, 2019. Yeah, just a minute. And the upcoming 2024. So any of you who feel you can go to, uh, places to observe the solar eclipse in 2024, you know who to talk to. The campaign for total solar eclipse 2020 to Argentina, uh, which is coming up on Monday, was canceled due to COVID and the closure of South American countries to US citizens. Dr. Fisher, Yana, Dr. Yana Mandra Fisher attributes her interest in astronomy to her father, Dr. Y.V. Somaya Julu, as they would discuss the nightly sky from their New Delhi rooftop. So uh, she, is, uh, she did her BSc and MSc in Delhi University, her PhD at University of Denver, Colorado, and an executive MBA at Claremont School of Business in Claremont, California. Her interest in the night sky seems to be her gateway to astronomy. After listening to Carl Sagan's narration, of Saturn's exploration by Voyager 2 mission. And so her career as a planetary scientist began. So we are going to talk to her today. She's going to talk to us about wanderings in the solar system, travels of an intrepid planetary scientist. So that's very exciting. So, so uh, Dr. Padma, uh, it's really nice to have you here today. Thank so, you, Mila, for having me. 
guests and uh, she's here all the way directly from the US uh, so there is a time difference okay so padma tell us how you got started in astronomy and space science what interested you in it okay thank you mila for having me and thank you all for coming on a saturday first of all uh, it's a weekend i know but uh, i'm really uh, thrilled that all of you wanted to hear me bad enough to be here the way i got started in this field really was by just observing the night sky and as i as mila said uh, at night time we would sleep on the terrace of our uh, uh, apartment in new delhi and we would be looking at things and my dad and i would be you know i would ask my dad what's that star what's that star at that time i didn't know there was a difference between planets and uh, stars anything that is in the night sky was a planet and it was a star to me but at the same time i have a, a picture here that shows two things that were very very uh, crucial for me to want to become an astronomer the first one is the the relation of uh, the big dipper uh, these are um, arabic names but in india if many of you know the culture of india and uh, if you had older sisters and brothers that got married you know that this is known as the saptarishi so the seven sages and one of the stars here um, basically this one here mizer it has so, a uh, uh, are you sharing something padma that uh, because yeah, you know can you, see, can you not see so, my uh, screen no so uh, just uh, just click on the share yeah. screen okay sorry i thought i had it on share okay let me ah uh. okay so if you see down below the share screen yeah now okay. it's starting yeah okay, that's great. right we can see it now okay great thank you mila sorry about that so the one the first milestone was this one that you, i you know at night we always see the big dipper and then from the big dipper if you join these two stars and draw a straight line is polaris which then becomes the arc of the little dipper which is over here and this one these names are written in arabic but when we when we were kids and i was to ask my dad about these stars this is the star which is a double star and it's called vishishta so that basically this star for married couples that are just uh, have gone to the wedding ceremony they show this uh, constant binary star and they're supposed to be the couple is supposed to have a happy life just like these two are so, so close to each other and so this is something that we grew up with culturally as i saw that and my father would tell me all these stories about the big dipper i always had a concern you know what i see in delhi or in india even if i went to my relatives places what i saw and understood of the stories i was always curious did they tell the same stories in other parts of the world and so that got me interested in geography as well as uh, on land <clears throat> not not trying to know about different cultures and countries but at the same time to know how the night sky looked at different parts of the world and then uh, people published books about interpretations of the big dipper and so this really was exciting that hey you can see the same thing at different locations and have different stories that basically match whatever you see on the sky and the second one was we had um we had returned to india in 68 from uh, the us and then um, nasa was sending out these autograph pictures of the three astronauts of uh, the uh, apollo mission neil armstrong and this is um, uh, buzz aldrin and this is michael collins and they were the first men uh, to land on the moon and so as a high school kid i wrote to nasa and they just asked for an autograph picture and they gave these stock pictures they had many of them so it was sent to me in india so these were the two major uh, these are the two major milestones that you know talking to my dad but we're getting wondering how the same stars can mean different things to different people around the world and then getting these from the first humans that stepped on another uh, solar system object besides earth and so these two things really uh, compelled me to look at astronomy as a career because i wanted to learn about these and i wanted to see if i could be an astronaut myself india did not have a space program that, as such and also an astronaut program so it always was exciting to think i could be the first one so that's how i got into it and so then 
um, what I did was I did my bachelor's and my master's from Delhi University, specialized, and then I went to Denver. Um, when I went to Denver uh, for my PhD, my father asked me to just continue with physics because I'd learned enough math and I really wanted to learn math. So he said, okay, fine. If I get math along with the physics, that's fine. And so I started planetary science at the University of Denver uh, in Colorado. At the same time, the uh, Voyager space, uh, spacecraft one and two were launched and were going by the Jupiter Saturn to study them. And then they were going to go out of the ecliptic so that one went out uh, north and one went across the boundary to see how the heliosphere, that is the entire region around uh, the solar system, uh, how it, uh, it, what was its composition. So these two spacecraft went in different directions. So in 1981, after I went to uh, University of uh, Denver, uh, Voyager 2 was going by uh, Saturn and the pictures as they came down, they came down to University of Colorado in uh, Boulder, a town very close to Denver. And there, Carl Sagan was the narrator of all these pictures that were coming down. And I still can remember how I impressed I was not only with the pictures of uh, Saturn, the planet itself, but the rings. And, uh, and it was just amazing that all of these could be uh, seen by a spacecraft. But from Earth, they looked like a continuous band of uh, rings, material around the planet. So then and there, I decided I'm going to change my, the uh, my thesis topic as well as my field. And that's one of the beauties of uh, studying in the US, I don't know how it is in, in India now, but you say, okay, you know what? I'm really not interested in this. I want to change and your advisors and your, teach, your professors, et cetera, they help work with you. So I was able to change my, uh, my thesis to look, understanding the size distribution of the particles of Saturn's rings in Saturn's rings. And that was something that was interesting because all, all my data was uh, data uh, collected by Voyager spacecraft. So I didn't have any Earth-based data. And I had to, I was doing a multispectral study that meaning, that's me, that means I was looking at the same object in different wavelengths and trying to com uh, combine and match it to a model that would essentially use the different data uh, sets at different wavelengths. And that provided the constraints on the problem that otherwise could have been unconstrained. So I was doing that, I was a postdoc at uh, JPL in California, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And as I finished that um, postdoc, I essentially became a uh, employee of J uh, JPL, but I was a little away from my field of uh, rings. I had to actually study planetary atmospheres and model them in a wavelength that I wasn't even used to, which was thermal or mid infrared, which is um, greater than seven microns. And so here I am suddenly, yes, I looked at planets and I studied uh, the rings, but poof, I'm now dropped into a situation where I have to model Jupiter's and Saturn's atmospheres, but using thermal data. So it was completely different. Yet, you know, I think that is one of the beauties of uh, any person who wants to do studies um, uh, astronomy or any subject for that matter, is that you are willing to take a little different approach than what you thought you should take. And if you're flexible enough, you know, it, it not only is it fun to learn, but you also make a lot of progress and you, you essentially became, become unique with your skill set. And so then from there, I expanded to different areas of not only looking at different uh, uh, spectral intervals, but modeling, also doing some kind of ground based observations. Uh, and then now, I essentially <clears throat> bridged the gap with the professional observers and uh, amateur astronomers. And it's really interesting because they have a lot of questions and yet they can also teach you a lot of things. So you have to be open to the uh, fact that just because you got a PhD doesn't mean you're the best and you know everything. Um, and it's that arrogance that you cannot have. Uh, and I think if you don't do that, then you will enjoy whichever field you're in. And for me, it was astronomy and outreach citizen science. Uh, you know, it was really interesting to um, do the outreach because you'd, even recently I found people who are in their 40s and 50s and had never looked through a telescope. And to me, it's like, oh my God, how, where were you living kind of attitude, you know? But 
the point is they are open enough to tell me that and we with my husband i have a small telescope that we were able to use in the backyard and show them uh, the planets that they had never seen and that, these are what i always look at so it was a very eye opening time and uh, one thing i have to say as a joke i have to say is a lot of people when they first hear i'm uh, an astronomer the first thing they start asking me about is their future in astrology and it makes me laugh it makes me cringe a little bit but i've learned to mask my uh, um, amusement because they take it so seriously so it's that's uh, a lot of people mistake you for an astrologer that is true um, but you just have to go with the flow okay yes, you know so what i've got to change uh, i think amila had a question for me i forgot if she asked me but uh, no um, yeah so let me get to that yeah we so we'll hear more about the outreach so mm -hmm. uh, yeah very nice to hear about your professional journey because a lot of these students are uh, you know interested in going into uh, ast astrophysics or space physics so do you want to put it on slide share so we can see the slides better yeah or this uh, how do you do that um uh, i can jump into how i what I yes. study and I okay so that's that. that's that's fine so let okay. me just talk to you verb, uh, verbally till then uh, so yeah uh, you know a lot of these students will probably have questions about how you went from Delhi University to the US and of course Colorado is one of the uh, uh, best places for space physics University of Boulder at Colorado so thanks for sharing your educational journey so let's find out a bit about what you do now, what kind of science. I know you're very active on social media too, and you have a lot of followers and you discuss uh, your work. So uh, let's hear a little bit more about what you do as a planetary scientist. Okay. Well, you know, um, the area of science research is such that you pretty much, how should I put it? I don't want to discourage people, but you have to write lots of proposals to get funded. And when you write a lot of proposals, they're not always on the same topic. They could be on related topics or new topics. And so what I did was I, I wrote a lot of proposals um, both on a pla outer planets, atmospheres, Jupiter, Saturn, planetary rings. Um, I mean, during Voyager flyby of Jupiter, they found it had a faint ring. So naturally anything that says rings means my ears perk up. So between that, and then I also started working on comets um, because uh, you, you have to be fully funded. And so I found that I, I was interested in comets because they kind of are primordial. And so you learn about how the solar system formed, but at the same time, you also have to know how the giant planets form so that in a planetary system, you must almost always have a giant planet and then you have smaller bits of uh, debris around either they coalesce and make other planets or they have um, they make comets whatever it is but that is how we as we learn and look at more and more exoplanetary systems we find that that's how planetary systems form so these two kind of seem like the two extremes for me um, in a planetary system comets and uh, uh, and the giant planets so since I'd already done my PhD in, uh, on Saturn and on um, spacecraft data, it seemed natural for me to find be a good fit for these two. So there was a, at one point there was a researcher at JPL who needed a second person to, uh, for a proposal that she had funding, but she was taking a sabbatical and couldn't complete the task. So I fell into that group and I was able to learn how to use a supercomputer to do some simulations of uh, cometary particles, but we, they were being modeled as non-spherical because uh, without getting into details of light scattering, it so turns out if you have a light particle that scatters by a, a spherical particle, then you get certain types of peaks in the spectrum. Whereas if there's a non-spherical particle, and you can also specify it's a refract dielectric constant, then you essentially get different features that we do. So see are you on the same? Way. We're still seeing the slide that says comets. Are you on that slide or uh, yeah, further I'm ahead? I'm just going to jump from there to... Uh, so the you can click on the uh, thing on top that says slide show. So you can, uh, you know... Uh, oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Okay. okay. And say play from current slide and then we can, you can just click forward. Okay, great. 
you know, some of these are from different uh, talks I gave at different locations, right. but I think they're pr very pertinent to what I'm doing. So this just tells you what the electromagnetic spectrum is, okay? And, and it tells you in, in this colored band up here, you can see this goes from 400 to about uh, uh, 700 nanometers. And we are sensitive to yellow, which is around here. So most of the stuff I do um, was in, uh, uh, at least for Saturn, was in the uh, optical wavelength. And so I started looking at um, comets and looking at the data from different comets, also in the same uh, interval. And so the techniques are different but as you can see here, it tells you what the wavelength is in terms of wavelength of frequency. So you have radio, microwave, infrared, uh, visible, ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma ray. And so this was the region that I focused on mostly. But in, uh, when I went to big gi giant planets, I basically fell into infrared. So I had to take my own data at different observatories around the world. And then uh, with the comets, I basically studied data that was already acquired in the visible to understand how the um, how the uh, um, cometary particles look like and all. So a background on the comets is that it was always considered by Fred Whipple that it was a, a snowball mixed with the di um, dirt, and therefore it was a dirty snowball model, which had refractory uh, dust mixed with primary primitive ices. And it sublimates as it gets closer and closer to the sun so that they produce a coma tail that follows that uh, actually the tail is formed and it goes behind the uh, comet. And the known sources at that time were the Oort cloud outside of the solar system and the Kuiper Edgeworth belt uh, around Neptune. And so what then emerged is the taxonomies were changing because uh, you know you could, you could get two comets from uh, the Oort cloud but they could be different because the composition is different or their activity level is different, et cetera. And so it could be that um, they might have, may, maybe they were stopped there because they were radially being transported towards the inner solar system and just got caught up in uh, with collisions, et cetera, in one of these other belts. And so the composition, the dust activity level, et cetera, it all changes. And so these were the emerging uh, taxonomies. And so why do we study the cometary dust? Because one, it does have the DNA from uh, the solar system, early solar system. And the difference in cometary dust is diagnostic of these conditions. But for all that, if you have a sub object that has dust, then it's best to study it in mid infrared because the mid infrared is essential, very well suited to the mineralogy of amorphous silicates and crystalline silicates, which are which are identified as part and parcel of uh, composition of cometary dust. And so, by studying mid infrared observations, you learn about uh, the silicate features and how they evolve with time and composition, and that's the only wavelength at which you can actually uh, study that. One of the famous topics of our uh, features in cometary studies is this 10 micron silicate feature that is around 10 microns between 10 and 11. You have these peaks if it's a crystalline silicate composition, if like uh, Comet Halley, it's an amorphous object whereby you don't have these very crystalline or sharp facets. And therefore the spectrum is very broad and you don't see these very tiny little peaks on top of a broad spectrum. So that's why, you know, this is very interesting. Anytime there's a new new uh, comet, you not only study uh, what its composition is in the visible, but Im immediately somebody will uh, try to get a, a mid IR uh, feature to look at this 10 micron. The 11.2 is very indicative. It's a pristine comet and it's giving out a very sub-micron uh, microscopic um, uh, silicate crystal, uh, crystalline silicate particles. So if you have a, a break in the comet or something special so this that is happens a, to see, it. So since this might be a little much for the middle school students. Uh, so so basi basically these are the lines you see when you take the spectrum, right? right? So you're looking for those lines. Okay. Well, you know, I'm going to start, uh, jump to 103P because even though I was doing everything, you know, you can look at the visible spectrum and the mid IR, this was one of the first, um, in a long time, it was one of the first citizen science experiments because we had professionals at the professional telescopes and we had a lot of amateurs around the world so that all these points 
were acquired by the different observers to put this entire spectrum together. And that is the beauty of, uh, um, of having an um, um, citizen science along with science missions is that you extend your observing teams and you learn if you're not, if you don't know anything about the object you're observing, but you know how to observe using an, your own telescope, then right. essentially you become a, 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 you become a member of the team and thereby people start sharing data and the campaign becomes uh, very, very successful. And in so doing, actually, um, we did one for Comet ISON. It came out in 2013. I don't know if you guys remember that, but it was observed by two uh, amateur astronomers in uh, uh, in the USSR. Or in, and it was unique because it's the first comet is coming in uh, to the into the inter, inner solar system. But it, uh, you know, without giving a lot of these terms, uh, definitions might be understand. It might be difficult to understand. But usually, this was a sun grazer topic, meaning it uh, goes very close to the sun and it disintegrates. But this one coming from the outer solar system, we had a lot of time to study it, even though we didn't have any uh, uh, telescopes and uh, missions in the, in the sky. So here, this is my first experience with, uh, solar, uh, with social media. So I was part of the science team, but at the same time, uh, social media was becoming very popular. And a lot of the, especially the amateur astronomers, they prefer to use social media. And so this is what the scientist perspective, this is what we wanted to learn, but we didn't have telescopes and time at every telescope around the world. So we, we invoked and uh, included amateur contributions. So we had ind individual observers and if it was a, a comet that was already seen before, they would have data from the previous apparition. And also we had amateur tel robotic telescope networks like uh, um, SLU versus eye telescope, um, you know, uh, and so we we had different uh, contributions and amateur. The reason they're called amateurs is because that is not their livelihood. They have a regular right. daytime job and they do this for fun. So it's not that they're amateurs because they don't know anything. They know tons of uh, stuff that even I don't know. But along with the individuals, now there were robotic telescopes that is a distribution of telescopes around the world that were then involved in these different campaigns. So and you so could go da get data from all around the world. and Exactly. And in a way it's, that means you, the object never sets because you're always taking data around the world. Um, right. you know, and then they, and the and individuals is their own telescope. So if it's a bad night, they don't do it. If it's a good night, they take more data. Whereas for professionals, we had to write up, uh, and this is one of the things I used to do regularly is write uh, uh, proposals to observe a certain object at a certain time. So you had to understand how the map changes. And we could do it once every six months. That's, that's the window when we had to submit our proposals. And if you got the time, wonderful. But if you got the time and the weather was bad, too bad, you lost the time. So that's why it's interesting to in, imperative to include amateur contributions because amateurs are so good at what they do now. And then all these cameras and filters are so cheap. They invest in that. So and NASA, what it wanted to do was to engage the entire planet, regardless of what your background was, in observing something like this as a global astronomical uh, event. And so they also wanted to develop a comet toolkit and showcase all the results. So then they wanted to keep track of the legacy lessons and uh, that you learn from different uh, observations. And I was very interested in the emerging and the shifting paradigm for research, which is uh, using social media and you give rise to inter interactive global network, but you also give rise to a new field that's emerging called big data. That is, you have a lot of data set and people have developed new techniques to study. And so here you, you can see the website for the meeting. Uh, this, this was designed by an amateur, but all the material here is uh, filled in by professionals. So for this comment, we had 14 NASA assets, but none of them were, uh, None of them was a mission to the comet and we didn't have enough time to build one. So we did all this, but also some of the comets uh, for this one and for other comets, some of the missions have to be stowed so that the part dust particles that come off the comets do not injure the, uh, uh, do not destroy the instruments while they're passing by. Here's a uh, professional observation. And then again, people write 
this is part of what planetary scientists do. You kind of assume you know where this is going to be by looking at the star charts, and this is the comet. The stars are uh, very round because you're tracking them, and the star, the comet is smeared. And this is by using a ultraviolet optical telescope, and you have to write, this was taken in uh, January 2013. That means they must have written the proposal six months before that, saying, hey, this is what I want to see. And therefore, they get the data, but then uh, essentially, you then from that data, you have to in infer how much material is coming off, is there nucleus, how big is the nucleus, et cetera. So it's very interesting, but it's a, you, ha you have to know your math. So there's no getting around it. So here's another one taken from HSD of the same comet, but in April. And again, you can see that in, indeed you take this data, you process it, meaning you apply the math models. And essentially this is north and this is east towards the sun. And you can see that uh, there's a little jet coming out from the front of the comet. So that's something that we learned by using HSD data, but for processing, there were a lot of amateurs involved in this step too. So this was NASA's challenge to everybody around the world, um, both professionals and amateurs, how to communicate NASA's vision and attract students into STEM careers. And that's one thing we found is that a lot of the amateur astronomers are wonderful and what they do, but they're all elderly in the sense that they're not young people. They're not college, they're not even college bound kids. And so the question is, how do you attract uh, students into STEM careers? Do they always have to be a rocket scientist? Probably not. They could be a communicator. They could be an amateur astronomer. There's so many different ways. And that's where everybody uh, who does STEM work for NASA now essentially tries to incorporate what their background is into how it can be uh, a STEM project and citizen science. So if uh, people are interested, there are, there's, a, uh, there's a website which is a list of all the NASA citizen science projects. And there's no age limit. You have an interest, you can do that. So maybe so I'll, uh, try, I'll try to find that site with you and share it with the okay. students because right. they might be really interested. And this one at the same time I was doing this, the Sky and Telescope uh, uh, Amateur Astronomy uh, Magazine, it, its headline was Amateur Astronomy Goes Social. They have Facebook, Facebook Twitter, and uh, um, this is Google Hangout. And essentially, I didn't realize this, one of my amateur friends that I had actually set up a website or a Facebook group said, hey, you know, did you see this? Your name's in it. And I said, hey, what does it say? And they said, well, it's about the new space, social, social face of astronomy. And wouldn't you believe it? This came out in August of 2013. Uh, Comet Isan was uh, you know, um, basically disintegrated in November. And this was very interesting. You know? So we basically said, OK, that's the, that's the medium we should be using, not websites, et cetera. And again, the reason I have this gallery here is to show what kind of information amateur astronomers can send us. And also that they're distributed all around the world. I mean, some of these are world famous uh, astrophotographers that you might have heard of, like Damien Peach. He is a British guy, but he goes to the Caribbean and Barbados uh, for a few months every year. And he does beautiful uh, imaging. And his, this is SLU telescope, it's a robotic network. Uh, telescope I was talking about. This Efren Morales, and uh, he's a guy, um, he's an ex-Marine. He lives in Puerto Rico and built his own telescope. And so he joins every campaign I have, regardless of whether it's a comet, it's a planet, it's exoplanet, whatever it is. And so, you know, these people are very interesting because they can actually look at any object they want. We have to stick to the object we write in our proposal. But you know the kind of telescopes we use, three meters versus eight meters, and the amateurs, the largest they use is 24 inches. Right. You know, it makes a big difference in the size and the spatial resolution. But they can take data when we can't. So there's always a reason uh, that to have amateurs in your objects. So because this is a, like a, a, a time series picture of, for over a month, and you can see two different people took the data, but you can see one, they actually see the tail of the data, tail of the comet, and here are the ion tail and the dust tail. The comets are probably, you know that they have two tails. And also this comet was on the verge of uh, uh, dying out. So it was uh, losing a lot of dust through its dust tail. One guy used in Australia took a picture of the comet as a spectrum. So we could see whether it's dusty or not. And turns out it was a very dusty experiment, dusty comet. 
And he right. was able to share that with the professionals who were actually building bigger spectrographs. So these are all the types of interactions you can have. Okay, and the social media part of it is interesting. You know, it's a very steep learning curve because nobody had done it before. And so we didn't know how to model it and how to model the group. We didn't know how to, what membership we should have. How do you make sure nobody uh, um, steals ideas from other people? Also, we didn't want trolls, we, you know, so there are a lot of little things you learned. And this was at the starting age, age of uh, social media. Right. Now, of course, you know, now the, not only do you have uh, Facebook, but you have, but it's not Instagram. Instagram. Yeah, Instagram and all these things. And I, you know, unfortunately, yeah. I didn't uh, do all those group things, but uh, you had to do Pinterest, Flickr, Flickr, then change it to, into something else. It morphed into something else. So in the beginning, we did all this. I did, I did a lot of Pinterest groups. And, you know, it becomes a lot of work. You don't do any research, but it becomes a lot of work. And people do that and because you do need some of that uh, resources to know what you have done. And so these are the collaborations between pro and astronomers. And then the objectives are to provide new resources, collection of the data, present um, ambassadors of astronomy or the amateur astronomers as bridges between public and the uh, professionals. And we promote inverse citizen science via global visibility. I mean, citizen science is just getting anybody and everybody to be able to look at it, take some data and give it to us. Inverse uh, citizen science is what I call when we basically know what we want to learn and we had to design the experiments and the observations so that people can do this. So, you know, you think a lot about these kind of things. It's just, uh, I'd love to say I sit there for eight hours a day, do my research of uh, computing and go home. But no, there are times that I'm observing at nighttime. And so I might be observing five nights at an observatory and, you know, sleep during the day. Or, or you know, you're doing something else and writing a paper or writing, or you're discussing with other people if they can do a certain measurement in the lab. And you so say you have to start defining all these things. And so things, it's a little bit of thinking process, but it has to be something that you can uh, be innovative about. And if you cannot be innovative, it's tough because it's a, I wouldn't say it's a cutthroat uh, uh, field, but it's a field where you have to show that you understand what you're doing and you can actually engage other people to work with you. So yeah, thanks for, yeah. So these are some of, yeah, that uh, that robotic telescopes, that seemed interesting. The students can probably. Okay. Yeah, like I said, now you have these virtual telescope is in, uh, uh, it's in Rome, Italy, and it has two or three telescopes, I think, and uh, Gianluca Massi, who's the director, he's also an astrophysicist. So he, if you go to his page, he'll, uh, sometimes he does, uh, uh, global campaigns uh, if of uh, interesting uh, astronomical event. Slu.com, Paul Cox is the outreach manager, and now they changed their system to different have different members, and you can right. throw all, 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 spread all around. This is the HST image, and then they have the Fox telescope, which is in, uh, I think the two of them, uh, one in Hawaii and one somewhere else, where what they do is they do take experiments for children or students. I mean, the, the range of students varies from very young children all the way to college going kids. And so this one, they had an observation campaign and outreach for Comet ISON. But uh, I heard that they're currently were looking at other comets that came out, uh, Erasmus and Atlas and other comets. And so when they do that, they actually have a lot of time that they give to uh, students. And I think this is something that it doesn't matter where you're from, but if you can write a good uh, abstract proposal, they can do that. Uh, right. Also, I think there's another, uh, telescope, uh, amateur telescope that's in Australia and in the US. And there's also a seminar that's associated with that. So you can actually take data, they teach you how to take the data and analyze it. So there are a lot of uh, activities like that that are coming up. And so you can see these are uh, established ongoing plan and cross disciplinary between amateur astronomers as well as a senior uh, uh, professional poll. And so I am now at the point of uh, doing polarimetry spectroscopy and also finding a way to or, uh, archive all this data for other people. So that's where I am. And you know, it takes a lot of time. Polarimetry people, you cannot, they don't, the analysis of polarimetric data wasn't available till recently. And till recently, polarimeters weren't available that could do the kind of science I want. Um, and so, you know, it's a lot of uh, learning process. And so these are the different uh, social media, Pinterest, Flickr, Vimeo. 
And then we had somebody who did QR codes for us. And these are all done by amateurs for us. Okay. Okay, I'm going to kind of, here's one I love. I always sh show off this uh, char chart because we were having a Facebook chat with one of the amateur astronomers in uh, Spain. And I was at the IRTF, which is a national uh, uh, telescope facility on the mountain of Mauna Kea. And I was there to look at ISAN, uh, getting mid-IR data, mid-infrared mid data. And this fellow was, a, uh, he had a sponsor who gave him a telescope and a, a dome, and but it was a visible light observations. And so he said, oh my gosh, it looks like the comet has two tails. And so, you know, I said, in what way, any images? And so Tony Angel says, have more patience. I'm still doing the <laughs> observing run. So, you know, you come to the point where you treat each other like friends more than, uh, uh, you know, somebody like an astronomer versus a professional. And so he says, I had to say, oh, Tony, I wasn't being impatient. I thought you had finished your observations because we were the first ones to see that the uh, comet was breaking out, breaking down, and we gave an alert to the entire world so that the amateurs could uh, take more images of this comet disintegrating down the uh, dust tail. Whereas the professionals waited one more day, so they didn't. They missed the actual uh, disin uh, uh, the um, uh, comet ship uh, where it was coming down the middle of its uh, tail. They missed that part of it because they were looking at some other uh, parameter that professionals can look at. And so they didn't get that answer till the day after, whereas we were ahead of other people. And, but this is one of my favorite charts because it tells you how professionals and amateurs interact and why we need each other. These are the two tales that he was talking about. I was at the IRT, uh, IRT after getting made in for a data. And here is the 11.2 peak. It wasn't there a few days before, the day before. But it was there the day after, after he told me that he saw two tails, we went and observed and there's the pristine ammonia particles that are coming out. So there's a lot of these little circumstantial pieces of evidence that you put together for your model. Okay, and I'm gonna pass on this one. Uh, staying in the limelight is the other uh, parameter where we had in people interviewing professional as well as uh, uh, prof uh, amateur astronomers. We had amateur astronomy, uh, uh, a radio station called Under British Skies. Then we had com community events and the Comet Festival, Adler Planetarium, took all the pictures of, from the amateurs and made a three minute movie to show in the uh, Adler Museum and Planetarium. And they, they kept our data up there for about a week or two, I believe. And then we had these, uh, Efren Morales, the amateur astronomer from Puerto Rico, he gave talks as well as uh, interviews in, uh, in Spanish in your Puerto Rico. And then uh, Damien Peach, his image, the image he took was wonderful. And then of course, Tony Angel saw the first outburst, so naturally he had his talk. And Terry Lovejoy is an Australian uh, comet hunter and Stuart Atkinson is a British uh, amateur astronomer. So they had in interviews on these uh, shows. And then other people who wrote poems and different people wrote poems and look at this person. He's actually a visual observer and he's using the edge of this uh, shed as a vignette so that he can create some kind of a shadow so he can see the comet as it's about to disintegrate. So, you know, th there are so many different ways one can uh, uh, take this as a uh, career and it doesn't have to be the professional, traditional, study the books and pass the exam kind of thing. You could do amateur astronomy, you could do education outreach, you can uh, essentially uh, art, draw art uh, from STEM, you can become a STEAM contributor. You can attend conferences. They have sessions on amateur astronomy. And so they come to meet professional astronomers as well as they show their techniques. And so it's a fun, it's a fun area to be in. I will admit that is a hard area to be in. But you know, I nothing, I don't know any field that's easy. Every field is hard. And so we had an National Science Foundation in the in, in, in the US had a contest for the best picture of Comet Ison because it was the first one that so many people were, were viewing. Four out of the six uh, winners, first, second, third, fourth, and uh, first runner-up and second runner-up, four of the people were members of our group. So I felt very happy. I mean, I thought I did something interesting. So in summary, these are the four, uh, four phases. You define the gaps in knowledge uh, by professional scientists. You integrate the science knowledge and outreach by engaging scientists, amateur astronomers, amateur the astronomy groups, students, 
educators, bloggers, uh, media, and then you embrace the la latest in technical and social connectivity like Facebook, Pinterest, Flickr, quick response, QR codes. Uh, we had uh, Twitter, Vimeo, things like that. And then you stay in the limelight that is not in the limelight of just doing nothing but saying, I saw this comment, but to, you go to meetings or you, uh, you publish in different types of magazines, or you basically follow the object as long as you can so you can get more observations uh, to put into the archive. So those were the things. And then uh, somehow I converted my file, so I don't know. But then no, we, I, I think we'll need to uh, probably okay. stop and take some questions anyway. Okay, we sure. I have only about 10, 15 minutes left. You know what, and I'll send these files to Mila. So yeah, so I can uh, convert it and give it to them. So I, yeah, go ahead and ask your questions. I'll just- uh, uh, Yeah, keep, so I think what uh, you know, uh, Dr. Padma is trying to show is that uh, you can all be involved through amateur astronomy, at least you can, because all of you are very good at social media and you can see that we have a, uh, they have a need for people who can, uh, you know, push, show the data and keep putting it up and writing about it. And of course there are actual, uh, whenever there's an object and same for solar uh, eclipses coming up, you need observations from everywhere and photographs from everywhere. So that's where students will come in. Uh, yeah, so thanks Padma. That was uh, a great way to understand how, uh, you know, an example of how you study comets and how you can uh, combine the information from amateurs to create a full, full knowledge. So Arjun, uh, do you see yeah. some questions there? Yes, uh, there are a lot of questions that the students were asking. So mostly they were related to the different phenomena of planetary and they want to ask from you. So let me just bring across a few. Uh, so they might yeah. have general questions in astrophysics that yes, are yes. not to do with comets. So just yes, be uh, we that. have a few for the comets also, but uh, okay. I will take first question from Sangi. He says that, ma'am, did the scientists discover that Mars has water in it and can we live over there? So it is. Yeah. Um, Mars is very interesting because it's gone through so many uh, stories and science fiction, but yes, they have found evidence of uh, water in different locations. And that's what the rovers have been finding out also. But can you live there? Not right now. There's no atmosphere, there's no growing, there's no way to live there because you don't have anything to grow. Uh, so that's why NASA is supposed to putting in effort and money into hydroponics and other ways to grow food there. Because if you cannot grow the food, you can go there, but after a few days, you're dead. So there is a lot of interest in that. And there is uh, programs that do that. That's, in the, that's NASA has a part of it called uh, human um, biology and all that. So that's for how people or astronauts or you know, citizens who go to other planets, how will they survive? What are the things they need? And depending on how long the journey is, you know, they have to think about their physical uh, uh, activity as well as being able to survive the journey itself. You, you go into hibernation. If you do, how do you come back? Somebody has to be able to bring you back, right? So there are a lot of these uh, questions. And so Mars is a very interesting object. Um, right now, I think as you can probably see it just went through its perihelion and its, uh, its polar caps are made of carbon dioxide. So it's not even ice. It's all subterranean ice, so it's under the ground. So, so yes, it's a, there. It's there is evidence of ice on Mars, but it's uh, hard to, to extract it. And no, you cannot live on it right now. Yeah. Okay. So thanks for the question, uh, so ma'am. So uh, Zena Bakchi, uh, he's asking that why is NASA going to Titan? What is there on Titan which excites me? <laughs> which which we um, Well, you know what. We're looking for habitable planets in the universe, or at least in our planetary system. And mm. the mission Cassini that just finished a couple of years ago, one of the things it found was there are a lot of methane lakes on uh, Titan. And there are also a lot of um, uh, hydrocarbons there, uh, the tholins as they're called after Bishankari at uh, NASA Ames uh, uh, coined that word. And they find that by uh, that you can create some products that were um, that can give rise to life, but you need to have the right mixture and they don't know that. So that's why a mission to uh, Titan Dragonfly was recently selected. Uh, and after uh, 
Cassini, there's no other mission to Saturn or Titan. So that's the, that's the interest. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So thanks. Thank you so much, ma'am. So uh, I have a question from Mokshi Agarwal. She is asking, ma'am, can you please recommend some citizen science project for children? Because she, she, she is also a middle school child. So she wants, uh, she wants to know some of those. You know, one of the first things that uh, I love uh, when I, my son was going to uh, elementary school was the um, phases of the moon. It's a very, it, you look up every night for about a month. And you draw the phases of the moon and you can join that. But you go to this website that says NASA citizen science slash citizen science. And they have, I think a 12 or 15 different types of uh, uh, citizen science experiments. Now, if you don't have you know, the equipment, some will actually, some uh, citizen projects require the same equipment. And if you don't have that, that might be tough. And others have um, ob observing log sheets. So they can teach you how to take your observations with their uh, naked eye, and then you can fill that out. Or another one is uh, characterizing earth shine, which is the sunlight reflected off the moon back to earth. And you can see that especially when you have a quarter or you have a crescent raining or a waxing moon, you can actually see the rest of the uh, shadowed part of the moon. And so you can do that too. You can do it at uh, full moon. And if, but new moon, and you can on either side of it to quadrature, that is when you're at the quarter part of its uh, orbit, you should be able to see some features. And it's all seeing, looking through the telescope and uh, drawing. And for the moon, you can actually look at it with your naked eye and draw it. So there are things you can do, anything that you can engage people to you know, do a common project or in wherever you are is uh, citizen science. But you can also look at the website because uh, you know it's just a matter of taking some data and mailing it in, and somebody else will look at it. Like pollution, you know, is the pollution greatest when the summer in Delhi, or is it the you know? And if it's pollution, what are the effects? I mean, that could be a very thing, very similar type of a questionnaire they can have as you do for other experiments, but you can say, okay, do you get headaches? Do you, does your vision hurt? Do your eyes burn? You know, there's so many questions. And so then maybe people can see what it is that uh, are common ailments and what it is that are uncommon. So there yeah. are many, many ways to do uh, citizen science. Exactly. Yeah, so yeah, so thanks for recommending so the we'll, website. So, we'll so also, I hope you'll be able to. Yeah, so we'll uh, also take a look and we'll try to bring it to the students and see what is appropriate for them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you know what? I think uh, if you have any questions, that's a suggestion I would have for you guys is anytime, not only the students, but Mila and Arjun, anytime you have a lot of questions about any topic that's going on, please send it to somebody at NASA or uh, send it to me and I can tell you who to send it to, forward it to, because I may not have all the answers. But there are a lot of people who are willing to answer such questions and they do that here all the time. So I would recommend you do that. And this month, December is very exciting. Uh, I had yes. to uh, kill some of those slides, but there's the Gemini the meteor shower. There's the, the 21st, yeah. And, and there's an eclipse next uh, Monday. And then of course, Jupiter and Saturn, the great conjunction and the superior yes. Jupiter right. conjunction on the yeah. 21st. So yeah. you have so many things happening that these are all objects. Uh, somebody at the Mokshit, Mokshi who asked Mokshi, about yeah. uh, citizen science. Right, yeah. she's very not interested. position of Jupiter and Saturn every day till December 21st and that's citizen science. You know? Yeah, yeah. So, so how they're coming close and basically when they are just and set that's up. the great oh, conjunction on 21st. That, and uh, that's, that's really when they close. look up on the 21st is the day they'll be very close to each other like a one tenth mm. of a degree that is one fifth yes. of the moon but yes. after 25th through the 27th 28th they'll be separating again mm. so we should be able to see Jupiter is coming this way and Saturn is coming this way the 21st they're both together and then they'll be going down uh, you know and pretty soon you lose them to the horizon yeah pretty soon you lose them anyway but yeah. at least at the end of the month you should be able to see them I think that's an yeah. exciting one. If anybody can see that, they, that's the first interaction to planets. And mm. they look like stars, but they're not stars. Okay, and, if you, yes. and you can see these two right now with a telescope and without a telescope. Exactly, because these two are the like the few the brightest objects you'll see in the sky. Mm. And I would love if uh, any of your students that are listening today, if they take any drawings, 
I'd love to receive any of them. Yeah, yeah, sure, ma'am. If if we receive any, we will forward it to you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, Arjun, Arjun, that means yeah. we can uh, launch a program like that. That ask them sure. to provide. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah. Great. So, okay. So, I have a, a question from Amulya Su that is also related to observational astronomy only. So, he says, uh-huh. uh, "How do you get when a comet will appear and at what place? How do you get to know that?" Ah, wonderful. You know, I'm glad you asked that because it's not easy to predict a new comet. Yes. And so, there are people that I do know. Two people in Australia and one person in, uh, uh, I believe, in Europe somewhere. what they do is they have automated systems they uh, built their computers and their telescopes in such a way that it basically takes data as it tracks back and forth across the sky and most of the comets that have been discovered recently are it's very hard to first of all discover a comet because you have these great big uh, campaigns now right but they tend to each person that i know tends to look at a certain region of the sky and so there's a uh, comet discoverer by the name of Terry Lovejoy out of Australia Brisbane and he has found he has discovered five comets so far and it's uh, you know he goes he works as a computer scientist during the day goes to work comes home and then he looks at his data all night and then uh, he basically covers the entire region in a certain part of the sky which i think is a blind spot for some of these surveys otherwise you are know, competing with the big surveys the palomar survey atlas survey and all that so it's hard but and you cannot it really cannot predict the only way these um, surveys do it is by looking at the stars in the background and from night to night they compare the position and if there is a change then they start uh, looking for it and then you have to submit it to the uh, comet center and you have to have somebody verify that so that you need three observations to actually show movement of the object and then when it's done that then it discovers gets uh, the credit so but it's a laudable goal to have because uh, you know there's still a lot of comets that are named after people that are that were discovered even after the service came into being yeah right so yeah <clears throat> so thank you so much for the answer ma'am and so uh, with that i have another question so i think uh, arjun we should yeah, uh, sure. ask ma'am Uh, or ask Dr. Padma Yanamandra Yana Fisher. What is the advice that you have for students? What are the kind of skills that they should develop? <laughs> and uh, you, know, uh, you know, because uh, I, because they're point, at that I, age. Okay. At this point, I might actually just go to my word doc because I had written these out first because I was uh, wondering who might ask me for some advice. Um, where is my page here? Outreach. And we can close this. Uh, presentation so you're again uh, highlighted well, my advice always is be curious if okay. you're not curious you're not interested then forget it because you know if you don't have a curiosity you will not want to know anything more than oh is that a star or a planet and that's it but if you're curious you really want to learn about anything and everything in your way and then the one thing i have found even for uh, adults is even if you have an interest in uh, basically astronomy or uh, telescopic observations what is your skill set what is it that you're really good at and if you are good at something stick with it because you know you even if you learn new things you need to hone hone in on your skills and improve them so it's always is a learning process so even if you know something and you're interested in it try to get as much information as you can <clears throat> and then seek the skills that will help you uh it, it's not always a straight line to achieve your goal so seek the uh, help or learn some skills like if you want to do uh, you want to analyze your own data learn the software learn the math that you need for it or you want to share your passion with somebody else that you say hey i saw this beautiful object it disintegrated as a comet and blah 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 what is important is how do you communicate that uh, feeling of uh, interest to somebody else so you have to become a communicator maybe learning some journalism or how to uh, educate people that could be some skill that you might need even if you're learning about astronomy um i i don't know what happened to my okay yeah But that's that, that's think, fine then, you're back yeah, yeah. and i think yeah. be helpful you know don't talk as if you are preaching to somebody if you are explaining something please be helpful to teach uh, share it with them because they may not know what to uh, ask you but that 
also helps lay the foundation of outreach. If you want to do outreach, some people don't care for the science part of it, but they want to be able to share what they see to get other people involved. Then, you know, make sure you can, uh, we get a chance to explain what you saw or share what you saw with anybody. Um, there, if you have children's magazines there, write to the editor and see if he will publish your work in there. And I think that is how you, um, that is what the suggestion I would have so that I am looking at young people who have fresh minds and fresh ideas and new technology and how do you integrate all these things? Um, I think some of us are pretty much done with our careers, uh, even though I'd love to do more outreach now than I ever did before. But uh, the younger people are the ones who are more savvy with the technology and uh, different ways of thinking of the same problem. So mm -hmm. I would encourage you guys to try to do some outreach just for what you like and what you want to share. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's great. That's a great advice, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, I think they're really, many of them are interested in um, astrophysics, so uh, they, they would really look forward to what you have just discussed. Mm. So, uh, you know, if you, if you want, I can, uh, you know, I'm willing to not only give another talk if you like on a specific topic, but if people have questions, just send them to me or send them to yeah. Mila and Arjun and they will uh, concatenate them and send right. them to me and I can yes. respond. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that. Yeah. Mm. So thanks for taking time out today and sharing your uh, experiences and your advice with the students. Uh, oh, thank you. Really sorry that I was a little late, but I felt a little flustered. No, that's not a problem minute. because there's a time yeah. difference. So, uh, uh, you know, figuring out the time difference exactly is the issue. Yeah. But I think it's the amazing. students are all very excited to uh, be part of such a talk on Saturday morning. Yeah. <laughs> You know great what? Way, yeah, great way to start a weekend, man. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? If they want to, I'm, I'm trying to find out since I was supposed to go to Argentina for the eclipse to do some science work. I'm not, but I'm trying to find somebody who's doing a live streaming. So if I can, I'll send the link to Mila. Or yeah, or and then to, I can share that. So for yeah, all of exactly. you, there is a total solar eclipse in Argentina and Chile on um, that that's view, viewed on Monday. So we'll try mm -hmm. to get you a live stream. Yeah, and, again, and I think thank... I, thought, I posted, I said Saturday instead of Monday, but uh, that one tells you what time, you know, you can go to time and date. Right. And actually, they're going to try to right. uh, cover it. But yeah, it's a really, you know what, even if you did nothing but just draw a circle as, uh, and say when the first contact between the moon and the sun is, figuratively, and show the different stages of the uh, of Bailey's beads as uh, the uh, eclipses are occurring in the and you know Earth shine, for example, or when the eclipse is over, and those, that's a fantastic thing because uh, India won't get a, a, a so total solar eclipse for a, a few more decades, mm. and so and this was going to be my last dress rehearsal before 2024, but I'm still going to go to the 2024 from here somewhere, right? And that's in the U.S. Yeah. So those of you who are going to go to college. Hey, think of that as your citizen science project. Right. <laughs> yeah. So thanks again, Padma, sure, for no being with us here today. Thanks, Arjun, for uh, supporting the session. And thanks all the students for being with us today and uh, you know uh, asking all the questions. And like we said, we could answer only a few of them. So we'll tie them together and uh, give it to Dr. Yanamandra Fisher so she can answer them for you. So with that, you know, actually, uh, yeah. if you have a way to take a picture of the entire students. Yeah, uh, uh, Arjun, have you done that? So let's let's do that. Yeah, sure. And we will, uh, uh, we've also taken this as a video. So we'll share the video with you also. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested to see the faces of the students that ask the questions, you know. And many That's of them I know have questions, but they're also very shy. So mm -hmm. it's uh, tough for them to ask questions and open public so you know if they want to send it to me by email i'm very happy to answer okay yeah, all right well so, thank okay. you so much for giving thank me the you opportunity so much, yeah. i loved it yeah thank you so much ma'am so it was very informative it was very engaging yeah i personally liked it too so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay great okay and mila knows mila understands everything because she also studied the same things and she was at rice right yeah. Awesome. Yeah. right so yeah so I've uh, 
I've given a similar talk and they'll hear for a, from a few more people coming upcoming next week is another professor at Delhi University. Uh, and also, uh, also we have an astrobiologist. So maybe mm. they'll, uh, ask some of the questions that you brought up the topics so they can ask mm -hmm. about that. Yeah, I think uh, both Titan, I mean, uh, Dragonfly and all the rovers too. I mean, the Zero is going to be launching pretty soon. And that's uh, another uh, mission to Mars. So they're uh, very, uh, they're very good candidates for uh, life. Mm. And you might want to ask what are the conditions for life and how do you identify it? And you'll find one of the, ha if they don't say polarization, I'll be stunned, but they have to say polar chirality, which is circular polarization, right or left-handed for life or as it's left-handed. But mm -hmm. I don't know what you can expect. And uh, that's an area too that's emerging. And it's a area that uh, uh, overlaps different fields of uh, planetary science. So in, you know, you, the students you have are young enough to go into the new fields. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. So that, thank you, everyone, and uh, bye. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so thanks, thanks everyone. Take care. Thanks, okay, Arjun. So I, uh, yeah.